creators. Today, well, we're so happy. We're in one of the, the, the most amazing studios in the world, world renowned. Artists like you two uh, have worked here, Muse, um, Brian Adams Studio, the Warehouse Studios in Gastown in beautiful Vancouver. And I'm here with one of my all time heroes for me uh, musically. Mr. Dave Rave Ogilvy, and thank you so much for, Thanks for, for having doing me. this. Thanks for having me. Very nice to and be here. I don't use that loosely because you know where I come from, a DJ culture and an industrial music guy and all that. But you, you have been, like, you are really somebody who's blazed trails within the music industry for your techniques and also for always having this sort of, is it okay to say, dance sensibility or rhythmic sensibility as well with your music. Thanks. Yeah, it's been it's been a, a a long road getting from this point to this point, and it's gone definitely uh, full circle. But there's some, I guess that might be a trait that's made it all work. And yeah, it's awesome. And you know, you started back in the day when you were cutting tape. I prob probably probably yeah, before came, digital I, world. Well, I came from the school of you know of classic recording studio techniques. I was lucky enough that I was originally from Montreal, but I didn't speak French, so uh, unfortunately I couldn't get any work in studios out there. And then I was able to come out here, work at Mushroom Studios, and I was basically tutored under three different engineers. And the nice thing was one was British, one was German, and one was an American. So I learned completely different recording techniques, but from the purest form, which was awesome because you can't really you know, pay to get that type of knowledge from these people. Um, and yeah, it involved full analog, cutting tape, uh, dealing with tubes, dealing with quirky gear, dealing yeah. with, you know, the, the, the real... MIDI lag for those uh, people who know all about well, that. Well, and th that, then, you know, Which the can't... advent the advent of when I did get into electronic music of everyone's... It's so easy to do stuff now. When you used to have to make a drum machine talk to one synthesizer, it was, as I used to put it with my friend Dwayne from Skinny Puppy, it was alchemy where one day you could do it one day you couldn't and it was always an adventure and there was never an answer and as soon as we kind of took that attitude of like machines talking to each other okay it should be easy it's not and we accepted it but we muddled our way through it and we were yeah we were able to do a lot of crazy stuff in that world what do you think the charm is from suffering like that is for um, for you as a as a producer um, is it sort of that you've learned to care for music more maybe well it it it, it you really appreciate what you can do so easily now and it's funny because there's a big almost a movement now people want to go back to that they want to go back to like if we're doing live shows we don't want to be using backing tracks on computers we want to be using live machines and i'm like are you crazy these things go out of tune they don't work and if you want to be caught with your pants down on stage this is an awesome way to go yeah which used to be you know a really really embarrassing thing with a, a bunch of projects i work with when you're doing a live show involving a lot of electronics and um, something dies and all of a sudden it's dead. Yeah. And you have 2,000 people watching you try to work with cables on stage, which is not very entertaining. Right. Well, in the modern pop realm, I mean, you work, you co-produced the Carly Rae Jepsen I hit. I mixed it. Oh, you mixed it, yeah. sorry. Which was uh, 11 million sold around was, the world. It was a number one single in the world, which I, yeah. you know, from where I came from, uh, that was something I would have never expected. Right, and, pure and pop. Pure pop, but that was the beauty of it when we were doing it. it was like I knew there was something good there, and I had no idea to what extreme it was going to go. Mm -hmm. But it really felt good when it was working on it and finishing it, and just realizing like this is something really good. And I, I personally, just thought Canadians are going to love it. Right. I had no idea how it would go worldwide and just become this viral crazy thing. But you well, know, I've who knew about Justin Bieber either. I mean, exactly. it just seems like it hit a mark. No, and it was great because you know I've had people. Uh, uh, use quotes where they reference the sound of the bass drum and I'm like I'm really proud about that because it's actually I think five and a half bass drums wow. and it was you know once again that thing I was talking about of building the foundation I spent I think two and a half hours just trying to fine-tune that one sound but someone noticed a, a lot of people seem to have noticed and I'm I'm makes me happy seeing just you know that's better than me than actual award when I see from a fan saying right. you know that's the sound that made my life that reminds me of my you know that summer and I'm like wow oh, that's pretty do, awesome. Do you think it's important that um, that people don't necessarily think about what they're hearing sometimes but they just like the song overall it might be what they're well, not that's hearing? Well the, the, the average listener that's what's happening but like I say their ears have been trained to they can hear out of tune out of time things but in the end, all they want to do is sing along to it, and mm -hmm. they just want to be able to 
hear a bass drum and hear a vocal, you know? Right. And that's kind of what the average listener, their ears lend themselves to. And I can't fault them on that because if you listen to pop music in the 60s, it's about the vocal. Pop music in the mm -hmm. 70s, it's about the vocals. It's always pop. It's refreshing when you listen to the old 60s music well, albums. The vocals are so up front. The vocals are up front and mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't have any of the chicanery to make them better, but mm -hmm. they still do the purpose. And to this day, that's what, that's what people gravitate to in that world, right. which is it, when you realize that, and especially with mixing, you, know, you have to cater towards that. Right. And it's funny when you'll get someone and be like, I just spent, you know, three days on that guitar sound and you can barely hear it. And it's like, is that going to sell one less record? Because they're not singing along to your guitar part. They're singing along <laughs> to that vocal. So, yeah. you know, there's sacrifice to be made. And it's Why all do I always sing along to Rolling Stone's guitar part? So I don't know what it is. That's not that. pop music. Okay, well, Carly Rae Jepsen, very poppy. But, I mean, one of the legacies that you've, you have is the, some of the amazing artists that you have worked with that are truly experimental in their their lives. I mean, you worked on a Heart's Filthy Lesson remix yep. with David Bowie. Yep. Uh, you worked with Nine Inch Nails, March of the Pigs yep. EP, Marilyn Manson's, Ants, uh, Manson's Antichrist Superstar. Yep. Uh, you, you've worked Peter Gabriel. These are, you know, yes, mainstream names in the, pol in the ether out there, but really, to a core, experimental. Absolutely. And so that must have given you a really interesting way of looking at approaching your music. Well, it's just amazing when I'm getting a, a chance to work with these people. Motley which is, Crue? Which is, yeah, when, I, I, when, I, when I'm sitting with some of these people or I'm working on their music and I realize, you know, I don't get overwhelmed by what it is, but when you're sitting there, yeah, you solo and it's Peter Gabriel's vocal. Or I've, you know, I did a Queen remix where this is there's Freddie Mercury by himself on a tape, you know, the same thing with the best that, front man I've ever seen still I, alive. I would probably agree with you on that. Yeah. yeah. And amazing recordings, but it's just a, an honor and a pleasure to be able to, to touch that stuff. And the fact that these people are allowing me to just always has blown my mind, but I don't let that get to me. I really just try and focus on what's at hand and realize these people have come to me to see what I can add to their music. And generally, I think it's been very successful. And uh, for, like I say, getting a chance to work on worldwide, international artists that are as famous as can get is yeah, just an it's honor. An, it must be yeah. an honor. And another big thing, too, which I learned the hard way, is there has to be um, an avenue for the music to be heard. Because there's nothing more disheartening than when you put your heart and soul into something and then you realize that's where it ends. Right. Where maybe a few friends hear it and maybe family, but it doesn't go out to the world. So I really, if I'm going to work on something and believe in it, it has to have the availability to be able to reach other people. So whether mm -hmm. it's because of a label, whether it's because of a distributor, whether a manager, it really has to be in place that if you're going to invest time, you want mm -hmm. it to be heard. Because you can, you can get paid and no one ever hears it, but that's, I, that's not what I like doing. Right. I'm like, if I'm going to do something, I want it to be heard. When, when you're talking to new people coming up in the in digital arts and music, and because you don't just do music, you can do all sorts of things yeah. to do with sound recording, voiceovers, video production, and all that. So, so one of the, one of the things I get from this is that you have to have a strong work ethic. The other thing is that you really have to be able to communicate uh, with people and make them feel comfortable, like they want to let you in. Absolutely, and and communication is, I think, one of the, my biggest strong points. And once again, I think that comes from my coaching background mm -hmm. and it's hard to teach that to some people because you know you'll see uh, a, a class where I'll go do talk to them and I'll see in their eyes that none of them have that skill to be able to go and kind of command a room right and that uh, how do you teach that right by practice you know right. it's that right. same thing unless you get a chance to do it you don't get any better at it and it's a skill that comes naturally to me but right. it's such a big part of it and I, I try to you get better you know, art from them, don't you? When you can much connect. better, and and you try. I try to tell kids that are coming up. You know, learn all your your pro tools, all your recording, digital aspect. Learn all of it, so that's never slows you down. But you also have to learn not just to talk to the computers, but to talk to the humans, and <laughs> being able to completely overtake the computers that they're now your friends, now you have to make the humans your friends. Right. And that's what a lot of people have a hard time doing because right. we do communicate way less. Um, and unfortunately, working with humans, that's a big part of it. To rewind a bit, you work with Bowie, Peter Gabriel, Carly Rae Jepsen, Nine Inch Nails, Motley Crue, all these people. There's probably someone out there who might be 14 years old and has their own little uh, digital 
desk at home and they're working yeah. on stuff and they're just getting started and they're looking at you and they're going, wow, like I'm overwhelmed right now what this guy's done. Can you let them know what you think about if they should go ahead with it or not or, or what they should be, is it okay to, to go on? To absolutely. pursue their yeah, absolutely dream. you have you have to follow what your heart's telling you and what your ears are telling you and if you can uh, do something that you believe in then other people believe in it if you're doing stuff that you don't believe in how can you expect a fan outside fan to believe in it you can't you can't just sell crap you have to put your heart into it and maybe nobody will understand it maybe nobody will get it but at least you're coming from the solid a solid base where it's something you can grow on right. and Anybody is capable of anything this day and age. They, that's the beauty. A lot of people, you know, are overwhelmed by the fact that like anyone can do anything and they say, oh, it's destroying everything. And I'm like, it's the opposite. There's nothing more exciting than when you hear something and I, I, I go to someone and say, how you did, did how'd you do that? What did you do? And they're like, I had a Tascam tape recorder that I ran into this and like, I'm like, brilliant. And that's just it. You have to take chances. Yeah. You have to just go with your heart and just Try and come up with something that you enjoy first. And if you enjoy it, then you can spread that to the world. But it can Discovery. come from anywhere. Yeah. Discovery and, and don't be afraid. watching The Creators and we're here with Dave Rave Ogilvie at Brian Adams Warehouse Studios, one of the most famous studios in the world, if not the, and uh, he's going to show us what he's been working on, a, a project that's come in and that he is working on right now and on this beautiful, uh, in this beautiful facility, on this beautiful board. Uh, so what is it you're doing right now, Dave? Well, it's funny because I was approached a couple months ago about working on an artist that I wasn't told what it was, anything about it. Um, and then when I actually heard it, I was like, this is amazing. And then I went and I recognized that voice. And it turns out that from my Project Jackalope, it was my bass player, Allie, who actually I saw when she was 15 years old in a band called Rio Bent. And after seeing her then, um, I was like, this girl's a star. So she did a bunch of years with me. She's done another project called Legs. It was amazing. And this is her new project called Little Destroyer. So it came full circle where I didn't even want to know how many years ago where I said, she's going to be a star, she's going to be a star. Right. So I've had the honor to be able to take their music and um, do a little bit of my stuff on it and then came in here and uh, actually mix the stuff. So this is a real treat because we're actually going to listen for you doing the final mix a little yeah. bit here yeah. of this artist who's about, I would say, going to blow up big. I think is going to be huge. This could be a bit the next big Canadian, you know, electronic, I, I don't know if it's electronic, I don't know what it is, but it could be a big, big act. And like I say, I'm very honored to be able to work on it. And um, being able to work in a facility like this um, always is a treat. And this is a whole new, you know, realm of digital mixing, which I've embraced fully. A lot of people mm -hmm. still are just pure analog. I'm, I'm good with anything. I just like quality. Right. And this is one of the nicest um, digital setups you can get to work with. So it's been, so, a, been a good good project. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off. For, for the layman out there who might be looking at this going, what the heck am I looking at? 
what are, what are, what are, what is going on? I've worked with the digital audio world before, but so can you explain a little bit about what we're seeing on well, the screen here? Well, the nice here? thing is this is this is working with Pro Tools, which is my you know digital workstation, um, where here's all my actual audio tracks that I'm looking at and have the visual of um, seeing what's going on and if I need to do any editing, if I need to move any pieces around, I'm going to be working all on there. But then it talks directly with this, which is just uh, digital information going through basically a giant mouse. But I have access to everything in here from the board here, as well as being able to see the names of things, see tracks playing, um, and instant access to, you know, I have a, a wall of some of the most awesome analog gear there is in the world. And I have um, the ability to just push one button and there it is. Now I have that in line. So with this setup, I have the, um, the, the best of both worlds, where I have top-the-line digital performance, top-the-line analog performance, and I get to mix them together right. with top-the-line world-class music. And it's very visual. You can see the sound files going across the screen, and you can see the kick drum where the kick drum is, and you can bring up whatever you want to see, every little piece of the, uh, of the song at one time. So let's, uh, let's take a little listen. Yeah, here's a little here's... listen of where uh, ba uh, Little Destroyer in the song is called Bad Cell. So thank you for the taste and the music, a little destroyer, and the, and we're going to play a little more on the end of here. But thank you very much, Dave. It's, thanks, it's a thanks pleasure. for having me. And, awesome talking to you. And sharing your experience with everybody on the creators because you, you're really an inspiration. So thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up, we're going to meet the band that Dave Ogilvie is working with, Little Destroyer. Michael. I'm Allie. And I'm Chris. Great. And uh, you have a new album, which you're working on right now. Correct. Which is quite an amazing thing that you've gotten together and, and done this. How did you find each other and how do you know you're like-minded musically? Oh, how? Well, we've known each other for many years. Um, we've all come from other projects and had a casual project together for a while and then slowly we realized that the sounds we were wanting to make were all on the same page with one another. Uh, so we kind of left our other projects and formed Little Destroyer um, over a trip to LA. Uh, and yeah, it was kind of came together like that of just knowing each other for a long time and then going, okay, of, of everyone we were working with, we're really looking for a sound that's going to like push boundaries and, and go further. And the three of us really gelled on. Right. So when you were in L.A., Jared Holmes, mm -hmm. Walk the Moon, Neon Trees, Headley, did you meet the, meet him there previously to you forming as a band, or did it, you meet him after, or how did that come in, the L.A. connection? You kind of got together in L.A. Yeah. Was he part of the L.A. getting together experience, or no? Um, I've known Jared for a long time. Yeah. And then I had gone, I'd moved down there for a Per, like just for my own kind of you know journey, um, the boys came down and we thought Jared and I had talked about let's just spend a weekend together and try to make some music. We'll see what we get. So these guys flew down, and within a weekend we had three songs that really felt like the beginning of something. And it's that's kind of yeah, three songs we were really proud of instantly, and we kind of right away kind of knew that that was the direction we were going to kind of take this. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it all gelled, and it was like instantaneous over these three days of working these 15 hour days, writing these songs from kind of nothing to something, going holy, you know, crap, we've, we're really doing something here. And you found the perfect guy to do it with you as a producer, Dave Ogilvie. Yeah. Who, you know, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, Bowie oh, so Queen. Yeah. 
skinny puppy, you know, brilliant. Now, one of the things I talked to Dave about was in, in the digital world of music, which you guys are also producing your music from, sometimes you don't get that vibe of it being human. I know there's a humanized setting in Pro Tools and you can do that, right, or Quantize or whatever, but um, you guys are actually getting your music sort of gleaned over by Dave, put it to another level. Um, I'm just wondering about what you feel he brought to you personally as a band uh, with your music. Did he take you to another level or did he find a spot that you needed to be? I think he helped clarify yeah. um, the, some of the sounds that needed to be clarified and pulled things back and just balanced it in a way that made all the songs gel together and everything shine in a way that um, like you could really experience my voice and my vocal performance uh, in the way that you need to and hear the emotion in it. When you were kids, was there something that hit for a moment that really made you want to get into music? For me, just jazz music was a huge thing. We had a, me and Chris had an amazing band teacher in high school that really took us kind of under his wing and really showed us a lot of amazing stuff. And, kind of nurtured our kind of abilities to just pick up something and start playing it, and he really kind of made it all happen for us. Um, what was his name? You have to give him John up. Ashbridge. Yeah, great band teacher. Best band teacher ever. It was really something. Actually, the first- In Vancouver? Sorry. He was actually in a small town called Elkford out by uh, Alberta border there. Yeah. The actual first professional musician I ever met, I came out to Vancouver to do jazz like workshop thing. And he told me, he sat me, pulled me aside, and he's like, don't do this. <laughs> don't be a musician. You're making a huge mistake. And I think I was, I was already at that point where I was like, this guy's crazy. Like, why would you not want to do this? Like, this is all I want to do. And now we know. What was his name? Who knows? Like, who, and who cares? <laughs> well, it didn't work out for him, obviously. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And for you? Um, as for as long as I can remember, I was just being like, I'm going to be a rock star, I'm going to be a musician. Um, grew up playing piano and bass and was writing songs when I was eight that were really moody and like the evergreen forest of despair. My parents were like, what's wrong with our child? So what do you think about the idea of putting yourself out there and going for it as an artist? Is it something you should pursue if you feel you got the burning desire inside? A hundred percent. I think the big thing for people who are starting to pursue an art or music or anything is to indulge in it completely in your life and then just work so much, always work, 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 every day, do it every single day. And at some point, you're going to have to show it and you will and you'll be stoked. Mm -hmm. And yeah. There's like nothing. I would say like the only time I really feel like I'm at home is when I'm on stage. And I can't deal with like scrut being scrutinized in the rest of my life, but I don't mind being on stage and feeling like, yeah, you feeling know, out there. I make it like, I'm gonna make it undeniable. And people might have opinions about me, but I feel confident in those moments. And like, I've worked up to that point and it's just like, you, like Michael said, you start at the beginning and then you take one step forward and you just keep going and you'll make breakthroughs. I don't think that being scrutinized is anything to stop for. Um, you have to just work as hard as you can and work, 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 work. And like Michael said, sooner or later you'll have to show it and you'll be scrutinized and it doesn't even matter. Just keep working and keep doing it. So you guys are on a really great bill, October 25th, opening up for the amazing Against Me dream and the come Commodore. True. Yeah. The dream come true for us. It so really is. You guys are sort of fall in punk sensibilities. How do you think it's going to go? How do you think the crowd's going to like you? I think it's uh, going to be great. I have no doubt. We're going to crush. No, we'll do good. We, our energy live is so rooted in just uh, punk. And everything I guess, that band so. stands for, really. Yeah. And think about standing on the Commodore stage. In front of, it will be packed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't be scared. It will be packed. <laughs> no, we're nervous, though. Very nervous. A big moment for you, so don't let us down. Yeah. We won't. This, we is won't. A, this is a big deal for us. Mm -hmm. All of us have always wanted to play that stage, and we're super happy to do it. Yeah, and especially with it? Against Me, oh, who yeah. is actually a huge influence on yeah. us. Now tell me about the video, because it's pretty raw. Yeah, but, the song is pretty raw. But you guys got the footage yourself with a friend? 
uh, and originally, and you put the video together yourselves. We did. Mm -hmm. And what's the song? The song is Bad Cell. It's a very near and dear to us, and really per like maybe my most personal lyrics. So we're gonna see some clips from the, the yeah. video. We're gonna roll the video. Enjoy. And you can see the extended video at littledestroyer.com. Correct. Great. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today on The Thank Creator. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. Thanks for having and me. And it's nice to get in early with you guys as you rise <laughs> to <any> success. <laughs> Mark our, yeah. mark our words today. As we ascend the crippling depression. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. I'll suspend.